I really shouldn't be talking about this stuff. Embodying the unsurpassable, resolving the great matter of life and death. Oh. So today we spent some time preparing for Roshi's birthday, which is coming up on Saturday, her 80th. And for those of you online who don't already know, um, you're welcome to join us. We'll be live streaming at 5 p.m. Uh, starting around 5, the ceremony, which will be here in the Zendo. Um, there'll be a slideshow and uh, some beautiful music and ceremony to congratulate Roshi into her 80th year. Um, so I've been going through photos of Roshi. I have about 30,000, according to iCloud has this incredible faces feature. And in the past 12 years, I've amassed a, a good number. And Roshi also has, has a bunch herself from uh, her former lives. And um, just in looking through these photos and seeing the themes, it's almost like I, I really considered just playing the slideshow for for an hour and just uh that would probably be a good enough dharma talk a, a better dharma talk than i'll give <laughs> but i mean we're sitting here in uh, what maybe you could say is roshi's great matter roshi's kind of legacy and mind and it has the effects of her time not just in the past 30 years but the past 80 years we've got the vajrayana influence green tara on my left and avalokiteshvara thousand armed on my right both expressions of upaya skillful means in a way um and wisdom and uh the chant we just did i believe is from tiknat han and as well as some 20 percent, maybe 30 percent of the chants we do is from the the lineage of tiknat han and of course we have bernie glassman um all around us as well. And Sensei Kaz and Linda, our, our dear teachers, are part of this community now. And I just feel so grateful to be, uh, to have the privilege of sitting here with all of you, to be able to in this beautiful space with our technology, you know, all of you online and Roshi's just ability to, or knack for just thinking outside the box and like, oh, let's take it to the cloud, you know, early on. And um, so we'll have some, some clouds gathering, hopefully not the physical kind on Saturday <laughs> or outdoor celebrations might be interesting. So thank you, Roshi, for your many years and for you, Paya, um, on behalf of all of us. And in reflecting on the word upaya, skillful means, my dad actually asked me last night, he said, well, what, did, what does it mean to you guys? Because I'm looking at the Wikipedia article and there's, it's like really long and it can mean so many things. I said, that's a great question. Um, you know, we take it to mean, I mean, basically it's our compassionate action, engaged Buddhism. And he said, well, that's, that's skillful, but what about expediency? I thought, interesting, I didn't really, I had, I thought, oh, skillful, expedient, same thing. But actually, they're very different, right? Expedient has the sense of not really true, right? And so, or it's, you're doing it for the sake of another end. And so it's a little bit like the story that we get in the Lotus Sutra of the father. Do you know the story? The burning house. So the, the, their children, three children, in a house that's burning and the father is outside and he knows that his children really love carts like horse carts or one likes goat carts one likes cow carts and one likes something else yama carts i don't know and they're all up there playing and the house is about to burn and he's like kids get out of there you have to leave now and they're like no no we're playing with our carts you know if you don't have the carts then we don't want to come down and he's like, no, you're going to die. you know. Uh, and so he can't get them to come out with the truth, which is that the house is burning. And so he says, okay, they're out here. Kids, there's a goat cart just for you, Jimmy. And there's a Yama cart for you, Billy. You know? And so he lies to them and gets them to come out because 
the house is burning and if they didn't come out they would die but he gets them to come out and of course living is the better cart and so the buddha says in the lotus sutra he didn't really lie he used expedient means to get the children out and so that sense of upaya is not really i would say that the engaged buddhism the kind of the, the working for the ending of suffering in the world alleviating suffering that's more like the skillful means we we do our best to learn how to sit and be present with what's arising to cultivate presence um, and openness so that we can be with the suffering of the world that we can be present and whatever arises whatever action comes out of that bearing witness and not knowing the three tenets that is our compassionate action our skillful action the expediency perhaps is more like the dharma talks and the the kind of the teachings on that which can't really be put into words and so as soon as i start talking or anybody starts talking about the dharma what you really are what is the true nature of reality what is the great matter of life and death and how do you resolve it that can't nobody can tell you that right you have to figure it out for yourself so then what do you do how do you as someone who's vowed to help people to help beings along the path how do you do that if you can't actually say it so it reminds me of um Kilgan's man in a tree do you know this koan it's kind of it's really funny so I remember it so Kyogen's man in a tree there or person in a tree um I like to think of Kyogen's you in the tree you're in the tree you're uh hanging on a branch of a tree by your teeth like this but your hands are like bound behind your back and you're like 60 feet off the ground I'm not really sure how you got there or why <laughs> but you're in a bit of a bind <laughs> someone comes along underneath you and says why did bodhidharma come from the west <laughs> which is zen uh zen code for what is the great matter of life and death how do i wake up please help me if you don't open your mouth if you don't say anything you evade your duty as a bodhisattva if you really think i cannot say that i can't whatever i say is going to be is going to defile him i i'm not going to open my mouth well then he goes along and you are of no help if you open your mouth you lose your life what do you do anything what do you do um anyway I'm not going to tell you what the answer is because I don't know I think I said to Roshi one time what do you do and she said well you lose your life you help the guy like, oh, oh. Didn't you didn't say that <laughs> okay she didn't say that um what do you do <laughs> so this is the dharma right if we open our mouths we necessarily do not speak the whole truth and if we don't say anything if we don't do anything if we don't practice it and help to help others along the path then we evade our duty and so expediency is the the other meaning of skillful means so at upaya the the, the word that means skillful means uh, i i think we try to uh, do both This, um, the chapter in the Lotus Sutra, chapter two on skillful means is also where we get this phrase where the great matter comes from, where it's first uh, written. Here it says, all Buddhas appear in the world only for the sake of the one great matter. That is to say, to make beings reveal their Buddha wisdom and vision, awaken to it and enter it, clarifying this is the great matter so it's kind of puts it in this good compact phrase the great matter which is then used again as zen code for kind of awakening to the great matter and so my title embodying the unsurpassable resolving the great matter of life and death the second part the great matter we'll talk about this first part embodying the unsurpassable which is another way of putting awakening is from I'm sure you recognize it our four vows our fourth vow 
And uh, that vow is the awakened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. So sometimes we'll read translations of this that say the awakened way is unattainable. I vow to attain it. Right. So it's just a straight paradox and they're all kind of paradoxical. But if you look at the, the characters, the words for is not attainable and I will attain it are different. So unattainable is wushang or untoppable, unsurpassable is really a good, it's like you cannot go beyond it. But then embody it or achieve it or attain it or realize it is chung, which is just that attain, achieve, realize. So the, the Soto school, the official Soto translation on their website is the Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. And so even that has a little bit of like, how do you attain something that's unsurpassable and why I love Roshi and Kaza's translation of I vow to embody it. It's not about getting something or attaining or achieving, you know, you, you are it already. Right. And so you embody it, you actualize it. So how do we do that? What's the, what is the embodiment of the way and realizing the great matter, resolving the great matter? Um, I was reminded of in thinking about, well, how do you, like Kyogen, how do you speak to the Dharma without defiling it? And how Dogen, and Dogen just has this quality of, it seems to speak to me and us, I think, in that way. You read Dogen and you get that meditative sense and you read it and you just feel, if you're reading it from a meditative place and not trying to grasp it with your mind, you, you, may, you may feel like, oh, yes, yes, yes. But then if somebody says, what was that fascicle about? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that kind of thing. And so if you're trying to read it with your mind, you might just say, this doesn't make any sense. And uh, I just reminded of a story that Roshi tells of her friend, David Finkelstein, who would teach her or talk to her about quantum mechanics, right? And he would, he would be very kind of eloquent and speak about quantum physics and how it works. And she says, as long as he was speaking, she felt like she was in it with him. She could really understand it. And as soon as he stopped speaking, it would be like, what? What, was, what did he say? I, I couldn't repeat back to you what he said. Is that right? Yeah. I feel like that's Dogen a little bit. And uh, fortunately, unlike quantum physics, where you actually need to understand it to understand it, I think maybe with Dogen, the whole point is that feeling, the feeling of embodiment, of taking it into your, yourself. And um, just on this, since we're on physics already, um, the great matter just reminds me of this thing in physics called the, the grand unified theory. Have you heard about this? The sense that, or the, the idea that there is one theory, one physical physics theory that can explain all phenomena. And right now we're, we're close in a way, we've got it down to like a neat and tidy two, quantum physics and general relativity. And Quantum physics talks about the very tiny, and you have all this weird stuff like that I talked about a little bit last time, and quantum teleportation. Or maybe I missed, I didn't talk about that, thank goodness. Quantum teleportation and, and uh, strange, um, spooky action at a distance and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, you have general relativity, which deals with the cosmic level. Well, everything above the size of atoms, you know, it's, but, but uh, really about gravity. But the two, the two ways of looking at the world are, are actually not compatible directly. And there's been, there's been a lot of work in trying to combine them or join them, and string theory and other things. But it, as far as I understand from my friends, I, they don't have the grand unified theory yet. And so there are certain questions, which are, there aren't a lot of them that deal with very tiny subatomic things that weigh a lot that we have no idea what happens. So the two things that I, I'm really curious about are black holes and the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Those are instances of, of tiny quantum phenomena at huge gravitational forces that if you don't have a grand unified theory, you really have no idea. It's a huge mystery what happened at the Big Bang and what happens in black holes. And so to me, it's a little bit like the great matter of life and death. It's like this one thing. Or is it? Is there a one thing and that we don't even know yet whether there could be a theory and we haven't proven that it couldn't be um 
but that was just my science aside. We're, we're done with science. Um, and so we were to the great matter. And I, I'm sorry if I got your hopes up that I would actually tell you what the great matter is or, or, um, or what, uh, what other people say it is. I'm, I'm not. It's just uh, an exploration, as usual, with the topic, which I find very interesting because we hear it so often. In the Shobogenza, the great matter, the words show up 43 times. And in the Denkuroku, it shows up 20 times. And often in the stories of the ancestors, you hear the phrase, settled the great matter of life and death. I settled the great matter, or he settled the great matter, or she. So here's an example, classic example of Dogen himself, written by Kezan in the Denkuroku. Although Dogen thoroughly grasped the, the, Rinz, the Rinzai style and was a true descendant of Esai, so before he went to Japan, he still called on priest Rujing, settled the great matter of his life, and returned to Japan to spread the true Dharma. So he settled the great matter. So we usually read that to mean, oh, he got enlightened, right? This is the moment in the Denkuroku where they got enlightened. They settled the great matter, and, um, and they went on to do their bodhisattva work. So what is that? Are we, is that what we're trying to do? Are we trying to settle the great matter? Are we trying to finalize some question? come to some answer, some grand unified theory of why we're here and what we're supposed to do. And, um, and this great matter, I mean, it, it's, it's not just in the text we read, but the very Han that was being hit just now by, was you right, Grace, hitting the Han. What does it say on there? Did, were you told what those characters were? Beautiful. Yeah. Great is the matter of life and death. Actually, it says literally, life, death, matter, great. Shoji ji dai. Um, and it's short for our, our evening gata that, uh, that we say each evening that we'll hopefully say tonight. If we remember, let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. Let us awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. And chills, right? If you really listen to that, it should give you chills. And the, the way we put it, you know, the great is the matter of life and death. Or life and death. We say life and death are of supreme importance. In other words, great is the matter. Uh, and often we kind of gloss that as, which is also true, I think, that the, the matter of life and death itself, being born, and if you spend any time with an, a baby, there's Skyla back there, you know, it's this miraculous thing. How we were all like that. We were all this, yeah. We were all just, you know, amazed with the world and, and fragile and sensitive and completely helpless. We were all like that. I can't, it's just, Unbelievable. And death, you know, being with dying, Roshi's huge work and in, in uh, bearing witness to that, that passing from the cradle to the grave. It's this, it, it has this sense of importance, of deep meaning, right? If we, we have to grapple with that, we spend most of our time, at least I, I can speak for myself, living as if I'm. I'm immortal, right? I'm just going to live forever. Things are going to be this way. I've got plenty of time. Probably not going to die anytime soon, except like that. People are dying right now, and it could happen to us. And so remembering life and death, I think, is of utmost importance, just in that sense of being aware of impermanence, being in touch with uh, with the fragility of life and the, and the deep meaning that that gives us. Because if we're living our life, it's like in the God realm, you have infinite lifespan almost. And that's the trick in the God realm. You almost have an infinite lifespan and everything's gravy and there's no suffering until the day where you realize you're going to die soon. And then it's the worst suffering actually in the realms, worse than hell. When you're a God that realizes you're about to fall to hell, because you don't get to go to the next God realm or to the human realm. If you're a God, you go straight to the deepest hell because you burned through all of your good merit and you didn't spend it on 
you know, good, good deeds and enlightenment and benefaction, you spent it on the God realm and now you're broke. So you get to spend another eternity in hell before you can burn off enough karma to hopefully make it back to the human realm, which is supposedly the only realm you can really wake up. So that's a little Buddhist cosmology, but it's just that, yeah, like don't act like you're a God, right? Your time is short. And so that, that reminder, Oh, okay. So this word shoji, life and death, is actually really interesting because the in in Chinese and Japanese, it's literally life and death or birth and death, and it has that meaning. But it also means samsara, right? It's at the translation. Whenever you have samsara, the word translated into the Sino-Japanese, it's shoji, life and death. So great is the matter of samsara. And elsewhere in, in, uh, in the discussions of the great matter, it's also said that the great matter is about karma. And so now we get really Buddhist, you know, it's about, this was the, the Buddha's big awakening, was the cycle of rebirth and escaping that cycle, and that karma is the cause of that cycle. And so whether you take it literally as there is an actual cycle of rebirth you're reborn into, reborn into due to your karma, or you take it as a, a metaphor, which I think often we modern Buddhists do, and uh, you know, it, I think both work, that of course our act, and we believe as kind of modern scientific minds, we believe in action and, and reaction or um, cause and effect. And, uh, and maybe it's not so, so much like if you steal something, you'll be a worm in your next life. But if you, if you act in a certain way, you'll reap a certain you know, you'll, you'll, you sow a certain seed, you'll reap a certain harvest, whether it's for the benefit or not. And, uh, and so the great matter of life and death is also the great matter of considering our actions, of bringing it back to how are we living? Are we living according to our conditioning and our, our kind of, uh, our just how, what's coming to us? Or are we living by some higher calling, something that we consider to be our, our, better way of acting, our vow, to put it briefly. Are we living by vow, which is often what we say, what we're doing here. What does it mean to be a practitioner? Is not just to be a meditator, it's to live by vow. And that perceptual life is, is deeply integrated into what we do. And it's not just like, don't kill, don't steal. Don't. It's like, how are you acting in every moment affects not just you, but everyone around you and ultimately the whole world, because we're all interconnected. And so that teaching of, of karma um, is, I think, the great matter. And um, just to have the, well, it's not the final word, but I'm just so grateful. And, and Linda, I'm so glad you're here. And, and cause to, uh, I'm going to quote him at length uh, from Dogen's 93rd fascicle on birth and death. And it's a very short fascicle, but it just has the pith about this about exactly what I don't propose to tell you, but maybe Dogen can help speak to this. How do you resolve that matter? How do you actualize? How do you embody the great matter in yourself? So Dogen says, those who want to become free from birth and death should understand the meaning of these words. If you search for a Buddha outside of birth and death, it will be like trying to go south with your spear heading toward the north. It will be like searching for the Big Dipper while looking towards the Southern Cross. Just, you will cause yourself to remain all the more in birth and death and miss the way of liberation. Yeah, thank you. And so that, you know, just right off the bat, you, if you search for the Buddha outside of birth and death, outside of samsara, right? We're always searching for nirvana and Buddha that is other than our kind of afflicted states and, and samsara, like we're trying to get away. But he's saying, no, this is, it's actually right within it, right? Just understand that birth and death is itself nirvana. There is nothing such as birth and death to be avoided. There's nothing such as nirvana to be sought. 
excuse me, only when you realize this are you free from birth and death. So the realization of nirvana, not saying it doesn't exist, but the realization is exactly the realization that nirvana and samsara are, are not separate. Right? And of course, this is a harder thing to hear when you're really suffering, right? And it's not a teaching, I think, that you bring to people who are suffering, like, oh, your suffering's actually nirvana. And you should just realize you're a Buddha now. Mm -hmm. And that's not the point, right? For, for bearing witness to suffering, for meeting suffering, we practice compassionate action, skillful means. We don't practice expedient means <laughs> um, in that way uh, with other people or with ourselves, you know? And so it's really finding the right, what's the right practice now? So we're sitting on our cushion and we're suffering and maybe you just need to breathe and loving kindness into yourself and and breathe loving kindness into the world and just you know try not to suffer so much. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. And sometimes you feel okay and you're a little bored and your mind's wandering. It's like, all right, get with the program. Great is the matter of life and death. Why am I here? What am I doing? Who am I anyway? You know, and you really focus in. What is this thing I'm going after? This great matter, nirvana, this is it outside of me? They say it's right here, right now. This is the part that just kills me, right? It's like, it's right there. Why isn't it obvious? It's obvious. Why, why don't I get it then? <laughs> Shut up. It's like, just, just look. And that's what we keep hearing. It's like, all you have to do is look. This birth and death is the life of a Buddha. Samsara is the life of Buddhas. If you try to exclude it, you will lose the life of a Buddha. If you cling to it, trying to remain in it, you will also lose the life of a Buddha. And remain, what remains will be the mere form of a Buddha. So it's not saying, oh, everything, you know, this is the kind of the, the abs being drunk on the absolute. Oh, everything's already the absolute. Everything's nirvana. Therefore, I don't have to do anything. I'm going to have my beer and watch my game and you know whatever the whatever your vice might be and play video games and um I, don't, I whenever i say that stuff it's like i'm not judging anyone okay it's all good it might be your skillful means um but just kind of flippantly saying well samsara is nirvana so there's nothing to do well that's just not helpful right maybe it's true in a kind of absolute expedient sense but if it doesn't help you be free of suffering, then it's really not true. It's not, it's not actually expedient. And so he says, you don't cling to it, right? You don't grasp after it, uh, after nirvana, and you don't cling to samsara. There's some kind of letting go. And I think this is just, it, it's such a good reminder for myself, at least to always come back to, well, this is what we're doing on the cushion. Whatever we're saying up here, whatever Dogen's talking about, it's got to be able to come back to the cushion. And so how do you let go without letting go of your intention, right? How do you cultivate and hold strongly to the intended practice like your hair is on fire, right? On the one hand, and yet let go. And it's like this fine, and when you're, when you're kind of in the flow of it, you can feel that. You're like, I'm just letting go, but I'm, I'm totally on. I'm completely relaxed and I'm totally present and aware and it's bright. And so that, that feeling of balance, of this perfect place, like in, in that, that uh, idea of the grand unified theory, if any constant in the, in the universe was just like a billionth of a percentage off of the way it is, then life would not be possible. So they say, right? It's like things had to be exactly configured however they came about in order for this to be here. It was like perfectly balanced, right? And maybe it's the case that that's why, that's why it is that way, because we're here. That's called the anthropic principle. Like people, humans exist with their minds to realize that because it was exactly this way. And maybe there are other universes that aren't this way and they don't have minds. We don't know. But the point is like that, that exact precision in order for us to be right here. And so for me, contemplating the exactness of 
you know, scientific constants gives me that feeling. I don't know about you. <laughs> a hair's breadth deviation and you are out of harmony, right? That's that, that subtleness. Of... Dogen continues, only when you don't avoid birth and death or long for it, do you enter a Buddha's mind. However, do not analyze or speak about it. Oops. Just set aside your body and mind Forget about them and throw them into the house of the Buddha. Then all is done by the Buddha. When you follow this, you are free from birth and death. It says, it says free from birth and debt because I misplayed. You are free from, that would be nice. You are free from birth and death and become a Buddha without effort or scheme. Who then remains in the mind? He ends there with that. Who there remains in the mind? So this is kind of a, now this is a way of practicing a kind of a gesture of faith. Just drop what you think about anything, body, mind, Buddha, not Buddha. Just sit and throw your body and mind into the house of the Buddha. Well, what does that mean? What, what is the house of the Buddha? It's just this, just this is it, right? Just this moment, just this breath, this body here and now, that is the house of the Buddha throw yourself into it right just be in it without without thinking about it without scheming i love that scheming because i i'm always scheming like how do i how i got into the dharma like i want to achieve shamatha and i want to get to this level and show me the show me the map well this map correlates with that map there's like there's a science to this right if there's a science to it i can understand it i can actualize it and of course and maybe that's possible for some people for me it was like because I was scheming, right? I had an agenda. I had a secret agenda, as Tsukhne Rukje says. So you have to have no hidden agenda. You have to be truly open, they say, and truly throw yourself into the house of the Buddha. So I'm still working on that, of course. Um, I haven't quite let go of my scheming, but uh, but I'm working on it. And so this, this, yeah, right? This throwing yourself into the house of the Buddha and then who then remains in the mind. And so that's the thing. It's like you throw yourself into the house of the Buddha. You're just there with it, but it's not, that's not it. There's like this sense of inquiry and that's the Vipassana aspect. That's the insight aspect. You don't necessarily have to put into words, what is this mind, but that's the feeling of that space, right? Once you're still and calm and you've thrown yourself into the house of the Buddha, you've gotten rid of your scheme and there's nothing to gain, there's nowhere to go, there's nothing to do. What is this mind? And that, that kind of leaning into what is this mind, what is reality, the basis of koan practice, I think the basis of most Vipassana practices, whatever your practice is, it's like, let it be alive, right? As, as uh, Suzuki Roshi said, I think. What is this? And so Dogen ends this wonderful fascicle on birth and death. So and each, each paragraph is kind of its own teaching, which is so wonderful. You can't, if you read it as like an essay on how to get enlightened, it's, that's not quite it. It's like, here's, here's something to practice with. Here's something to practice with. Here's something to practice with. So we just had throw yourself into the house of the Buddha. And now here's like just the classic every day from Shakyamuni Buddha himself in the Dhammapada, which I've quoted before. But there is a simple way to become a Buddha. When you refrain from unwholesome actions, are not attached to birth and death, and are compassionate toward all beings, respectful to your seniors, kind to your juniors, not excluding or desiring anything. With no thoughts or worries, you will be called a Buddha. Seek nothing else. And so that sense of just, it, it, again, kind of undercuts the scheming and the kind of levels and the ranks and all of these things and the hierarchy. It's just like, if you can really just be a good person, what does that mean? What do you, how do you want to live? 
And I think this is what it really comes down to. It's like, what is your great matter? What are your values? What are your North Star precepts? What do you, how do you want to live? And I think we come together as a community, the residents here, and those of us in the, the, the global Sangha as well, by sharing some of those values and vows. It doesn't mean they're necessarily better than others, but we just come together because we share them and we support each other to live by those vows. And so we actualize the great matter every day. You know, we actualize it by washing our bowls and cooking our food and sitting together and keeping the place beautiful. And as I look out and, and I feel like we're in a bower of trees here and think about the 30 years of Upaya, of Roshi has some pictures, which I'll show in a slideshow of this, this, these, these, well, how big is it? Like an acre of just dry desert scape, kind of like, you know, and now it's just huge trees everywhere and uh, shade pools. And so when, when people are asking, well, what should I get? What should we get for Roshi for her birthday? And, and she's just like, how about trees? You know, how wonderful. Let's get more trees. And so that's what we said to whoever asks. And, you know, you can find our, our tree, tree giving site on the website. Just being upright, living by vow, cultivating shade pools of goodness. That's it. Maybe that's it. You don't have to strive for something. And, and so for each of us, it's each of these paragraphs from birth and death, and perhaps each of the paragraphs in Dogen's whole Shobogenzo are little bits that we can take and say, how, does this speak to me? And how does it speak to me? And how can I practice with it? And then when we hear that evening gata, do not squander your life. You'll know what to do. You'll know how to practice. You know? And if you don't know, you can ask Rosh. So I can think of no better way than to end than to, than to, to Baba Wawa. Thank you. <laughs> and so we'll chant the four vows and have the evening gata. Thank you. Thank you.